just where we're coming from in our disciplines. In your own field, has there been any significant, significantly new knowledge produced in the last 10 or 15 years? There have been magnificent uh, innovations, magnificent breakthroughs, breakthroughs, not on a colossal level, but on a major level, in recent 20 years in at least three fields connected with my field, cultural research. First, a new semi, a new uh, quasi-discipline emerged that's called cultural psychology. A large group of psychologists finally recognized that the psyche is not something that dwells in the head only or in the nervous system, but is something that is the result of uh, socio-cultural uh, parameters. So even the self, even the self is no longer an isolated psyche. That has been a major, a major change in the view, not yet accepted by many departments of psychology all around the world, but if you are interested in this field, you can already have a 1,000 pages handbook of cultural psychology published a few years ago with this summarizing very well the uh, achievements of the field. That's one. Second field has been um, uh, all sorts of ramifications of economic studies. Uh, thanks to Pierre Bourdieu, we have a different view of economy. Someone has given it the name Bourdieu economics to honor his name, that is including parameters of culture within economy, understanding that economy as the uh, Marxist model and, and um, all the development that came from it uh, are no longer tenable to understand the economy and therefore in business management, in departments of economy, in uh, people studying globalization, commercial interactions. It all started with a fellow whom I mentioned this morning, uh, Gerd Hofstede in Holland, who was an engineer and who was faced with the uh, impossibility to communicate between various societies and uh, since then we have more and more work you have seen the group sitting here has seen the reader I, I, I accumulated of over 1000 pages about cultural competence much of it is innovative in the sense that these perspectives were not part of the classical literature about intercultural relations because it has to do very much with acculturation, immigration, intercultural relations at large and so on. And, no, the, third, sorry, and the third field where you have, in my mind, the most exciting development, most exciting development is the field of cultural evolution. Um, promoted, developed, by a group or several groups of biologists. So it's in biology. It does not study only human beings. It began with the study of other animals, claiming that without culture, those animals will not, would not survive. Many animal, animals can survive with the help of their genes, but other animals cannot survive without learning from each other, each generation teaching the younger generation what to do. That is, where you get your food, how you get your food, whom you mate, and so on and so on. And uh, the group, since in, it's in only in the last decade, the number of studies in this direction has been so overwhelming. People in London, the University of London, University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and the University of, Sc of Stockholm, few people in Italy, one in Vancouver. This is the international group of biologists. And one of them, Alex Mesudi, from Professor Mesudi from the University of London, 
in one of his papers where he preaches the necessity to establish a new science of culture. He's not even hesitant to use the name, the word, science of culture, that many humanists didn't like at all. He says, the failure of sociology, anthropology, the social sciences at large, is that they do not talk to one another. While we biologists have been speaking to one another for the last 100 years, learn from one another, and so he wants to throw to the garbage can everything that has been written about culture in the, within the framework of the humanities and the social sciences and begin from scratch. But okay. much of the work is highly innovative. My problem, sorry Andrew, with the people you've mentioned, with Bourdieu, Hofstede, Mesudi, whom I haven't read so I won't comment, uh, is the supposition that a culture is systemic. No. And no. you can, it is, it certainly is. You know, Hofstede, you go and get your parameters for these oh, different yes. things, and that's your culture. And Bourdieu's supposition that the field is entirely determined yes, in France. Behind that, behind we have to go beyond that a beyond, lot, I beyond, think, beyond. to get to the very frag sure. culturally fragmented sure. communities okay. that we're developing, okay. not just in Europe. Okay. Let, let and that means that. going beyond those apparent yes. discoveries, okay. and the systemic nature that un underlies the biological metaphor as well. When I mentioned Hofstede, I didn't mean to say that we have to accept Hofstede's theory as is. I said that Hofstede started a movement, started a motion, started something new. Now, the biologists, true, they work within the framework of uh, the theory of evolution, I don't know whether anyone has um, suggested uh, so far a better theory to deal with the uh, nature of uh, living creatures, but the innovation is that they manage to, in a way, to focus our attention on the fact that culture is not something that goes beside life. That is, that first you have culture, and then you have some sort of culture. In their view, in their view, culture is a condition for life to exist. So in many ways, they are more courageous than anthropologists and sociologists who have been uh, talking about cultures for the last 150 years. You see, they say, no life without culture. And as a result, they define culture, and to me this definition is highly acceptable because it allows for so many perspectives. Culture is the stock or the repertoire of solutions that is passed from one generation to another through learning. Through learning. So people learn, animals learn from one another, what they call social learning, which is the most economical, and therefore, this allows them to survive, survive in a sense, find food, find mates, organize life, understand what's going about in life. And of course, in human societies, it gets more and more complex. In some animal societies, um, the culture is not as complex. But this is an innovation conceptually, because they give you a completely new and different basis for conceptualizing about culture. You don't have to apologize anymore if you wish to um, deal with culture, and you don't have to legitimize uh, your interest in culture. Here you have a very solid and strong basis telling you culture is a condition of life. It's not just a result. It's not a superstructure, as in Marxism. Mm -hmm. I, I think this has been the most exciting innovation in recent 20 years. Thank you. Um, one form of cultural evolution um, is, of course, mimetics. Yes. And um, I found this very exciting about 15 years ago. And together with Femir, funnily enough, whom I talked about the other day, um, um, we, we both introduced mimetics into translation studies in the late 1990s. A meme is a word that was introduced by, by Dawkins in, in his book The Selfish Gene, 
back in the 1970s um, to be the cultural equivalent of a gene. So a meme is any kind of idea that replicates itself and gets passed on and people learn, such as uh, how, do, how, do, how, do we, how do we make warm clothes? Oh, look, the Eskimos there down the road, they make warm clothes out of seal skins uh, and they use special bananas for the zips or whatever it is that they have. And uh, let's copy that and see if we can make similar clothes. Um, or think of uh, whoever it was who first invented the idea of an arch, yes. the Romans or whoever it was before that. I mean, that's not an obvious idea. And as soon as one culture notices, hey, guys, we can build arches, and then it kind of spreads around, and we get different kinds of arches, and so on. So these are ideas that get passed along from one culture to another. Okay. Fermer and I were not working with each other at that point, and we didn't know that we were both interested in the same idea. But in the same year... Or well, within a year, we had both published work um, suggesting that memetics would be a very fruitful framework for translation studies because translations are, as I said at the beginning of my own book, they are um, vehicles by which memes are carried from one culture to another. Translations are carriers of ideas, you might say, and they get replicated and copied and so on. And what has been, for me, <coughs> pessimistic in a way, is that uh, very few scholars within translation studies in the last 12 years have actually taken up that. It hasn't seemed to have been a very fruitful development within translation studies. Perhaps one reason for this would be that if you look at the history of memetics as a particular branch of cultural evolution, uh, it's also come in for a great deal of criticism within, but by other cultural critics, cultural scholars. And so it's not been by any means universally accepted as the way to go in, in uh, cultural evolution. But it still seems to me to offer quite a productive conceptual framework for thinking about the cultural role of translation and other ways by which ideas get passed on in society. A group like this, for example, uh, we are throwing ideas about. Um, somebody will catch on to an idea... I've already caught on to one or two, passed on by my learned colleagues here, and they mull away in one's mind, and they m merge with the ideas one has already, and maybe, maybe new ideas will form, and we'll have a new seminar, part two or something, and how, where does this go from here? But uh, my pessimistic point is that um, this way of seeing translation, um, using a memetics framework, um, hasn't really caught on in translation studies. And maybe I blame myself a bit for that because I, I've been a bit distracted myself in, onto other areas since then. But uh, that would have been a potential path to take, which I think, in, on the whole, the field hasn't taken. The other point I want to make is um, also a bit pessimistic in a way. You asked, Anthony, what were the big significant new moves that we could see. It may be that there have been huge moves, but we simply can't see them. And my classic example would be Darwin. When Darwin read his first paper at the, um, at the uh, science... Um, the, 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 the Royal Society in, in London in 18-something... Um, no one thought it was revolutionary at all. And, and the, the, the minutes of the, in the annual review of the, the year's events, uh, there was Darwin's paper and there was Wallace's paper, both d introducing, really, uh, evolution as a, as, a, as a new way of looking at the history, uh, at evolution in biology. And the minutes simply said, you know, not a very interesting year, nothing much of much importance seems to have happened this year, rather a dull year. I mean, they just didn't see it. And it may be that we are not seeing things that, 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 that are going on. Can I, I pick up on the memes? I mean, I remember those two papers coming out. And at the time, really, the, the notion of a meme in itself seemed and still seems to me terribly essentialist, idealistic. The problem is, what do you identify as being a meme? And you're ultimately brought back to the classical problems of equivalence. I think that, that there's a very fundamental problem there with, um, with what I'm calling indeterminacy in our theorization. It seemed very essentialist and idealist yes. uh, to carry one of forward. That's the criticisms that yeah. was made of it, yeah. certainly. And, then, and indeed were others. But an idea can still be 
found to be useful, even though there has been some criticism. But if the criticism begins to be overwhelming, then the idea just gets dropped and we move on to something else. I mean, that is in itself cultural evolution. Um, is it true in your disciplines, respectively, just as a starting point, that ideas and methods, ideas, memes, have moved from the West and have been globalized? That, that we have lived through in the 20th century a, a, a massive movement from the West to the rest of the world without any real return, without ideas coming from beyond the West uh, being picked up and used within the West. Much came from China, but then since the 18th century, science has been basically produced in, in the West. That's, uh, that's uh, you can't, you can't uh, turn your 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 face from that and uh, everybody else adopted that now japanese chinese mathematicians do contribute to mathematics and physics nowadays you can't open a journal any learned journal in mathematics physics biology cultural psychology with kitayama uh, without uh, having Japanese, Chinese, uh, Malaysians, uh, and other people considered to be Eastern belonging, and I Indians, of course, so that uh, I don't know. Science uh, was developed in the West, but the rest of the world participates rather overwhelmingly. It is that in our research, in our own disciplines, because of the sort of thing you're describing, we don't have to confront a radically cross-cultural situation. We seem to avoid that because the discourse is the discourse of science or of the humanities all over the world. True. Okay. I don't know if that's true in linguistics. I assume it is, and, and in translation studies or anything else. We have calls at the moment for non-Western translation studies, and that's where I'm getting to. Do we want to entertain support? Andrew, you uh, the broad answer to the question about whether ideas from the West are spreading out in, throughout the world and rather than vice versa is yes, I agree. Um, uh, but what interests me is why. And uh, one could think of um, at least two typical characteristics of, of the way in which thought has developed in the West, which has given it the edge over the way in which thinking patterns and thinking behavior has perhaps developed elsewhere. And one is uh, the importance of asking questions, quite simply. I have learned this recently this year that there are languages, for example in Australia, where there are certain sorts of questions the grammar doesn't allow you to ask. You simply cannot ask a direct question at all. And there's no structure which allows you to do it, certain sorts of questions. That must be an enormous obstacle to any kind of intellectual curiosity. Um, and I think as long as people ask questions and as long as the society is such that questions can be asked, questions are not banned, there's always the possibility of inquiring and querying and so on, then things move forward. But as soon as you're not allowed to ask questions or questions are not encouraged or you are imprisoned if you ask questions, then everything gets stuck. And this connects to the second, the second characteristic which seems to me to be very critical for Western uh, thought is simply the ability to criticize, um, which includes not just the freedom to criticize others without which science would be dead if we don't permit ourselves the right to criticize other hypotheses. And if we don't also have kind of self-criticism, then we are dead ourselves if we never can learn from criticisms that are directed at us. So any kind of culture that simply denies rights to criticize or denies self-criticism is going to get stuck. This is, if there are non-Western uh, approaches and questions that can be asked, um, great, let's, let's, uh, let's see them. But, but um, I, I haven't been overwhelmed with non-Western type questions, I don't know. I mean, have you? I mean, can we, can, can we have some examples of, of, of methods or questions that would be somehow very different from those questions which have been asked in the West, questions about translation, questions about culture, 
Are they radically different? I would rather think of all the societies where, where one, one should not ask questions, where disagreement is punishable by prison. Or and they're inferior criti- criti- societies, aren't they? Um, I think they are societies. If they don't, if they don't encourage criticism um, and questioning, then they're probably not going to develop as richly as a culture where this would be the case. There is evidence to show this, surely. They're just stifled. Uh, Okay, that's getting to it, because there are many, many cultures based on consensus rather than opposition. That would not do what we're doing now. Consensus doesn't exclude... In Japanese society, nobody cut me off when I was speaking, and I'm going to do it all the time to you. I'm sure you see. You see. But that's our rationality, and there are many, many societies that value consensus. I don't think it's got anything to do with rationality. I think we could... There's a different... Way of organizing the discourse of knowledge. How does that sound? Oh, that's rather better. Good. And we've got one way of doing it. And are we really in the business of imposing that on the rest of the world? And I suspect we are. Uh, Imposing is the wrong word. I think one can be descriptive about this. Um, And in fact, one can do the kind of research that um, Professor Evans O'Hara has himself been doing, which is to say you can look at cultures which have encouraged debate and exchange and transfer and interruptions and arguing and all this sort of stuff. And you can see what has happened to them over 500 years. How do they cope with... uh, increasing heterogeneity, how do they cope with the preservation of their own identity, but also with their evolution? It's the the age-old problem of how to preserve my identity and yet not get stuck. You have to preserve a a nucleus where you are happy to say, this is I, this is me, this is my group, but there also has to be a sense of being open to that which is different, what can we learn from others, and so on. and if you look at, if you compare these societies and you find that some societies have not wished to ask such questions or they have been closed to the outside world, such as the period that you mentioned in China after 1420 yes. something, whatever it was, um, um, then you see that, that the cultural life, cultural richness, richness, it begins to decline. You can simply show results of a certain sort of way of dealing with the other. Just as you can, you can treat translation, translation quality in the same way. You can say, here is, a, here is a translation which has these and these characteristics. Are my readers pleased? Do they work well? Do, do they, are they good translations? Well, people react. They don't really like them. They, they, they don't work. So you can, you can, you, you, it's not a question of imposing. For a, it's not the scholar's business to impose, I don't think. The scholar's business is to compare, to describe, If you develop this way, I predict that this is what's going to happen. If you develop that way, I predict that that's going to happen. The the problem, I mean, it's a classic problem we faced in describing translation quality for us, but when people do it in cultural studies, it gets a lot worse. When, for example, Germans describe their society as the pinnacle of civilization, because quality for them is the maximum degree of freedom that a system allows the individual, they're applying their definition of quality on everyone else. And that, that is a conceptual imposition. There are many societies that would not see that as, as a definition of, of quality, as, as, as the direction you want to go in. So we can argue about definitions of quality. Absolutely, and that's a very important argument to have, or realize the plurality of possible answers. Yes, but one can also look at... Uh, the way in which possible answers influence the development of a culture over time. A wonderful case study would be Bhutan right now, which has uh, made a decision, or the king uh, has made a decision, that uh, uh, economic progress or whatever shall not be the crucial measure of development in Bhutan, but there's going to be some kind of a happiness measure, which of course we all smile at. So the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Well, yeah, okay, all right, Uh, okay, all right, let's, uh, okay. But I mean, um, in other words, if there's a whole culture that makes a decision that it's going to, it's going to rethink the notion of what is a better society, a better way of living, I think the scholar's uh, reaction would be, that's very interesting. Let's see what happens. It's a kind of a living laboratory. Yes. We don't judge it now. We judge it in 100 years' time or whatever, and we see what's happened. I want to get with that line of questioning is, should ethics concern our research? 
and Andrew is very descriptive, I would imagine he would say, no, I'll describe ethics. I cannot conceive of a theory of translation action without ethics, but I think there are descriptive ways of describing ethics. You can say, here is this society, it seems to have these and these ethical values, it prioritizes these kinds of ideas about quality or goodness or the good life. Okay, that's a descriptive view of ethics. And then I can say, here's another society which has a very different concept of what is the good life. Let us see how they have developed, let us see what happens to them, let us uh, try out lots and lots of different criteria. How do they treat the sick? How do they treat the elderly? How do they treat the rich? What kind of education system do they have? Uh, what kind of taxes do they have? One can ask a million questions across these, uh, comparing these different societies, and you can let the reader come to conclusion. You, of course, can come to your own conclusion as well. But you can include ethics without being prescriptive. You can include Ooh. ethics descriptively. I think, I think that's the way we have to go. I have no idea what ethics is, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, book up here. No, I know, I know. No, 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 no. I know, <laughs> I know. There are books. I, I, in my undergraduate studies, I, I studied philosophy. I, uh, I had courses in ethics. I understand the notion. Um, I suppose that uh, we researchers uh, adopt ethical attitudes, whether we like it or not because we simply accept some sort of ethical consensus in uh, our society. What okay. does, what disturbs you? Yes, I would like to know... What, what disturbs why, me? Yes, yes. All why, right. Why have you raised the question? Why is it... I'm interested if, the, if the in question. choosing to study cross-cultural relations, mm -hmm. we have, as if it were by the act of choosing that object of study, ah, okay. a commitment to dialogue with cultural others. Or not. And I'm interested because our discipline is living with yes. a decision to boycott a cultural other, to, to, to try to solve a, a problem by not talking with a oh, cultural some, other. Some and I'm wondering if there's some contradiction between that kind of ethics, yes. boycott, and the ethics of dialogue, which is embedded somehow within our object of study. That's what's tormenting me. I see, okay. Do you well, want to make a comment? A short comment. Uh, we study cross-cultural relations or we study intercultural relations not always motivated by <laughs> the will or the wish to bridge between societies. I can imagine that many scholars are not interested in bridging bridging between cultures, many scholars would work in the service of certain cultural premises that would like to block other cultures. They study the other culture in order to block it, as I said before about translation. Well, most of the scholars we read pretend to be interested in bringing cultures together, but you cannot avoid observing that many features that they find in some other cultures are not to their liking at all. So they wouldn't like, you wouldn't like, for instance, suppose according to the norms prevalent in your culture and according to the ethics you believe are prevalent in, your, in Western culture, you wouldn't like a culture that where women are, and children are cruelly beaten Beca interfere with your own culture. They, you wouldn't like these features to to migrate from another culture to your own culture. No, but I the would contrary. Like to talk with those people. Yes, sure. but if you cannot talk with those people, you are looking for strategies to block those features. Yes. Now the whole world is not satisfied with many features of American culture. You know, what is identified as American culture, sometimes under the misguiding title of globalization. For instance, people are very critical of American fast food in many countries because of obesity, because the, the number of obese children grows in certain countries. Now, one child out of four is obese, already at the age of six or seven. 
So what you have to do is learn about fast food, learn about McDonaldism, <laughs> yes, or such strategies, and then you try to block them. So you, ha you have many, many instances where studying the other is not in order to negotiate with the other or create some sort of dialogue with the other, but in order to protect yourself from the other. I'm not... I don't think that the boycott that you're referring to is cultural at all. It's a political boycott. Uh, it's an attempt to, to have an effect on uh, Israeli foreign policy. Um, some people have joined it and some people haven't. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a cultural issue, personally. Talking with or not talking with, whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's not a cultural issue, it's a political issue. Talking is very cultural. Talking is cultural, yes, but uh, one, yeah. I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah. I mean, I have not joined it um, um, and said publicly why, but um, I think it's a political issue. It's, it's uh, a way of, uh, a way, which may or may not be valid. Some people think it's valid, other people think it's not valid. A way of trying to change Israeli foreign policy. You don't see any relation between that and what we do in research? There's no... Um, I, I don't think it's a research issue. Okay. I mean, you can research it, of course, uh, indeed. But I don't think... Uh, I mean, I can uh, say, for example, that um, I don't eat ostriches, ostriches, uh, but I don't think... In other words, I boycott the eating of ostriches. I do not eat ostriches, I could say. Um, but I don't think that has anything to do with whether or not um, I study this or that in translation studies. It's not a re research issue. It's an issue of personal ethics rather than professional ethics. It's a very poor comparison. Eh? 